Mike mentioned in the video there, we are headed this week. 45, about 45 workers this week from our church are going to be putting on a Royal Family Kids Camp for 29 campers this week. It's our second camp. Yeah. I'm excited about that. Um, at the end of our service, we're going to pray for everybody. Everybody that's helping uh, should be wearing a blue shirt. If not, that means they forgot to wear their blue shirt, but we'll pray for everyone at the end. Now, these 29 campers, I, I don't know all of their stories. I don't know what their, their parents did do or didn't do to cause the government to get involved so much so that these kids uh, have to be removed from their homes. Uh, but I know that because of that, these children have experienced a great deal of trauma. They already have experienced that. Uh, and, and really, the effects of that trauma is going to ripple throughout the rest of their lives. Something foundational for them, their relationship with their parents, has been severed and broken. Uh, there has been damage that has been done in that relationship. And today we are talking about that relationship. Now, we're in a series of messages this summer on the Ten Commandments. And uh, I didn't plan it out this way, but today we're looking at the Fifth Commandment, which deals with the relationship between children and their parents. Now, as we'll see, it's more broad than just parents and children, but specifically our, our starting point in what we're talking about today has to do with this very issue. So let's take a look at the fifth commandment today. We find it in verse 12 of Exodus chapter 20. It says this, honor your father and your mother. Now, out of all 10 commandments, two of them are expressed in a positive way, and then the remaining eight are expressed in a negative way. And what I mean is, is that two of them tell us what to do, and eight of them tell us things that we should avoid. You shall not have any other gods. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. But two of them tell us what to do. And it was the one we looked at last week, remember the Sabbath day, and then this one, honor your father and mother. So I think this is significant. When two of the commandments tell us that we, we need to do something, we need to take note of that. It, you know, avoiding something... Um, it can be difficult, but being intentional about doing an action is sometimes and often even more difficult. And so these two commands, last week's command that we looked at and this week's command, are, are, are specifically said in a positive way. These are actions that we need to do. And it starts and it just says this, the action we are to, to have is that we are to honor. Now, the Hebrew word translated honor here is a, is a, a word that means heavy or weighty. Uh, when I was in college, uh, I went with three friends to Europe, and we went backpacking in Europe. Now, if you think of like legitimate backpackers with the big backpacks, that's not what we did. I had like a school backpack, <laughs> and I had like a change of clothes or two. And uh, we were there for two weeks, and uh, we stayed. Uh, we, we, we were like in a different city almost every 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 day, and so it was like speed tourism. Uh, but early on in the trip, we were in Germany, and uh, we stayed in Munich, and near Munich is the city of Dachau. And in Dachau was a concentration camp in World War II. And so my friends and I, we had made plans to, to go to Dachau, and we had to take some public transportation to get there, and we had to walk a few blocks after we got off the bus. And I, I remember my friend, we, he borrowed another friend's camcorder. Now, for those of you youngins in the room today, I know <laughs> this was like a real, like we had to put tapes in there. We had like multiple tapes we had to bring along, battery packs, it was this big camera. And my friend, Jamie, he's a missionary now to Indonesia, Jamie Kemp was filming us walking, uh, you know, at, at, at the bus station and then walking the several blocks up to this memorial, this, this museum, this concentration camp. And... I remember watching the video when we got home because there was a very stark difference from when we were walking to the concentration camp in this museum, uh, and we were we were lighthearted. I don't I wouldn't say that we were being too flippant, but we were you know college students. We were having some fun. We were talking, and then the camera goes off as we were walking into the or up to the location, and maybe 30, 45 minutes later, 
the camera turned back on and we were inside. And, and I remember when I got back from the trip, seeing the stark difference from kind of the lighthearted, oh, what are we getting into? We're, we're headed over here, we're, having, you know, we're enjoying the sights, to all of a sudden being in that museum, in that concentration camp, and there was a weight to that experience. Do you know what I'm saying? Maybe you've had a situation like that, where the weight, maybe you've been at a memorial, uh, Pearl Harbor, or one of those kinds of, uh, you know, in D.C., and you see those, the Vietnam Memorial, or the Korean, you know, all those different memorials, and you, you just have this weight that's kind of the idea that's behind this word honor here. When we talk about honoring our father and mother, we're talking about honoring or experiencing or considering the weight of those people's position and uh, who they are. So when we honor the dead, we are, we are remembering or we are weighing out the worth of the lives that were lost. When we honor God, we remember and we weigh out his awesome power and his might and we tremble at his authority. Uh, in fact, this word that is used for honor here is a word that's constantly used throughout the Old Testament that to, to talk about God's glory, the kavod or the kavod. And it's this weight of his presence. Uh, when we talk to an important person or when an important person comes in the room, we stand up, we shake their hands, we acknowledge their position. When we sing the national anthem, we should stop and consider the sacrifices of those who have, have served our country so that we can experience the freedoms that we have. There's honor. There's recognition. We take time to reflect. So to give honor to something is intentional. It's giving thoughtful reflection to something. It's to consider the value or the worth or the weight of it. It's to humble ourselves or to give deference to someone who has a greater position than we do. And so who are we to do this for? We honor our father and our mother. Now, I don't know about everybody's homes here, but I would imagine from talking with some of you that when it comes to the house, anybody, like who, who's, whose homes were like mama is really the one that rules? You know what I mean? Like if you talk to my boys, like I have my moments where I am the authority figure, but don't mess with mom, right? <laughs> like you can get by, I'll joke around with the boys, but then there's that point where uh, you know, mom will yell from the other side of the house, why aren't they in bed yet? And then I'm in trouble, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Here's the thing about this here. When we realize, when we read this, I don't think that sometimes we realize the significance of the last couple of words on this phrase here, and your mother. You see, the ancient world, when this command was given, was a patriarchal world. Men ruled. Men were the dominant people in society. I mean, even so much so, I'm sorry, but even so much so that fathers would basically uh, you know, would sell, their wife, sell their daughters with a dowry to be married to someone else. Like, it was a financial transaction and arrangement that they did. Men simply were in charge and ruled, and that's the way it was. But right here in this commandment, God takes time to mention not just the fathers as would have been expected, but he also mentions mothers as well. And all the women said, Amen. come on, right? Yes. Look, the Bible, we talked about this last week. Some people view the Bible as this repressive, backwards, ancient book. But there is an, an immense amount of evidence all throughout the scriptures where God is supporting and valuing and up, uplifting women and justice and equality. It's not just some backwards thing. The problem is sometimes we read texts like this with our modern understanding and we just think, oh yeah, fathers and mothers, no big deal. But, in, but when this was written, God is saying, no, the, the mother, you are, you are valuable in your home as well. And the command is clear, honor your parents. Now, I've said uh, just about every week in this series of messages on the Ten Commandments that these commandments are written very broadly, and that's because ancient laws were written very broadly. They were meant to be principles. You know, today in our culture, we look for loopholes in the, in the law. We have to word things. This is why you have a terms of service on software that you use and, and websites that you use, because the lawyers want to try to find every loophole and close it before, the, before you can find it. But in the ancient world, the laws were general. I shared a couple of examples on the first week. In Exodus 22, 1, the law says that we have to make, there, that there needs to be restitution that's made if someone steals uh, a, a, an ox or a sheep. The law is very specific. If restitution needs to be made if an ox or a sheep are stolen. 
But nobody in those days would think that they could get away with stealing a goat because it was a different animal. The idea was that it was a principle that was to be followed. In Exodus 21, 18, there are penalties if someone is hit with a fist or with a stone. But no one would think that they could get away with kicking someone or hitting them with a piece of wood because it's a principle. It's a broad thing. So honoring your parents, this law is written in the same way. But it might not seem like it, right? Because it seems like this is very specific. Why would God specifically tell us to honor these people in our lives? But it's actually a broader application. See, in the room today, there are all sorts of different kinds of relationships. Some of you have siblings. Some of you don't have siblings. Some of you have children. Others of you don't have children. Some of you have spouses. Others of you don't have spouses. Some of you have uh, bosses. Some of you don't work, so you don't have bosses. Some of you have coworkers. Some of you work alone or you don't have a job. Some of you have teachers. Some of you don't have teachers. But there is one relationship that every single person in this room has. We all have parents. Now, you may not like your parents. You may not know your parents. Your parents may not have even been any good, but all of us have had parents. That's how we got here. And if you need someone to explain that to you, we'll find one of our teachers and they can talk with you after service, right? But all of us have, all of us have parents. And the parent-child relationship is the most basic, fundamental, universal relationship that all of us have. It's the first relationship that we have. And arguably, it is one of the most, if not the most, important and impactful relationship that we have. So as such, that relationship serves as the basis for all other relationships. So when God tells us to honor our parents, he's starting at a point of commonality with all of us. St. Augustine said, if anyone fails to honor his parents, is there anyone he will spare? You know, the idea being, if we don't respect authority in our home, then we're not going to respect it anywhere else. It starts with the relationship that we have with our parents. So honoring our parents isn't a very specific law that should be underneath an umbrella of some general thing. No, honoring our parents is the general law because it's the foundation for all the other relationships that we have in our life. If we can't respect, if we can't honor the most basic of human relationships... How can we honor anyone else? And so by implication, when God tells us to honor our parents, he's telling us to honor anyone with authority over us. And, and really, the Israelites would have understood this because often uh, they, would, they would use the terms father and mother to talk about people that weren't actually literally their father and mother. In 1 Samuel 24, 11, we see the Israelites call their king father. In 2 Kings 2, 12, Elisha calls the mentor uh, of his, Elijah, the prophet over him, he calls him father. In Judges 5, 7, Deborah is called mother in Israel. The point is this, honoring those who are in authority honors God because all authority ultimately comes from him. So when we honor our parents or when we honor others, we are ultimately honoring God because all of those positions and all of that authority comes from him. So children... Honor your parents. But children, regardless of age, it's not just little kids that this is for. In fact, when Moses gave this command, the entire community was present there. And you could argue that as the decision makers, really this law is aimed at adults taking care of their grown dependent parents. So we need to honor our parents. But this has broad implications for our society. Employees, honor your boss. We talked about last week, we need to be the best workers that we can be. And that applies even here in this law. We need to honor our boss. We need to do the work that we are assigned. We don't sidestep or dishonor management. We support our authority. There is spiritual authority that we need to honor as well. Citizens, we need to honor our government authority as well. That can be difficult at times. It can be difficult on a a local, state, and federal level. And depending on the year and depending on the administration, different people in this room struggle, struggle more or less. The, the bottom line is, though, we are still called to honor those people who have been put in those positions. Whenever we start talking about honoring authority, though, this question comes up. 
How do we honor someone who misuses their authority? I mean, think about these kids that we're going to be working with this week at camp. We want to show them God's love. We want to treat them like royalty this week. But how does a child who's been removed from their home because of what their parents have and haven't done, how do they honor their parents? And maybe some of you in the room here today, maybe you've got hurts and pain from your past because of your parents. How do you honor that person? Or maybe you work with a boss who misuses his or her authority and they belittle you and they knock you down and they make your life just terrible. How do you honor that authority. We, 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 could, we could take a long time and talk about politicians and the corruption that we've experienced, especially uh, throughout the, the last uh, you know, several years here in Illinois. But how do we honor those people that are in civic authority over us? One of the classic examples of someone who misused and even abused his authority is King Saul. Uh, you can find uh, King Saul's story in the book of 1 Samuel, and it spans several chapters. Uh, and you can certainly look it up and, and take a look at that. But Saul was a, a, an awful king. Uh, he was violent and he was moody. He didn't trust his men. He made rash decisions. And at, at one point, he determines that he is going to kill one of his most faithful, loyal, and uh, trustworthy warriors. One of his most successful warriors, David. This is the David that killed Goliath because Saul and the rest of his men were too scared to be able to do this. David stepped in. And won that battle. David put his neck on the line time and time again to fight the Philistines and their enemies. And yet Saul, for no reason other than his own insecurities, decides that David must die. So Saul begins to hunt David down. And it's kind of a fascinating story of cat and mouse as David slips away time and time again. But at one point, David finds himself hiding in a cave. And King Saul and his men don't realize it and they come into the cave to, uh, to rest for a while. And uh, David's hiding in the back, and his men say, David, this is your opportunity. You can kill the king. The prophet already told you that you were going to be king next. You're the rightful uh, next heir. You need to go kill the king right now. And so David is, is moved a little bit by the, the words of his men. He, he sneaks up behind King Saul, and he cuts off a corner of his robe. He doesn't actually go and kill the king, but he cuts off a corner of his robe. And then in verse 5 and 6 of 1 Samuel 24, it says this. Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. His men wanted him to kill him. His men wanted him to cut Saul, but instead he cuts a corner of the robe off. And David is like, I should not have even done that because he has a position of honor and I need to honor him. And so what David does here is he doesn't focus on Saul's actions. He could have been justified. This guy's going to kill me. This guy's accused me falsely. This guy has, 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 has changed his agreements with me time and time again. He could have, he could have complained about all the different things that Saul did to him, but instead, what does he focus on? The position that he had and the place that God had put him in, his authority over him. And David determines himself to honor that position. So he goes out to Saul and he talks with him and he says this in verse 11. And notice what he calls him. He says, see, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. What does David do? He publicly honors Saul. He calls him father, and he even declares his allegiance to him. Now, the words honor and respect are really synonymous. And so uh, I don't want to make too big of this next point. But I find it really helpful. Uh, I listened to a teaching that uh, Pastor Craig Rochelle did on, on, on leadership and authority. And he makes this great distinction between respect and authority. And he might make it a little bit too much, but I think it's helpful. He says this, respect is earned, but honor is given. And he makes this distinction. He says, respect is about what the other person does, but honor is about what you do. And so I think this is helpful for us to recognize that there is a, a point where we give honor, and that is our action, to honor the position. We don't have to respect or like all the things that they do or the way they treat us. But when we are dealing with a leader who misuses or perhaps even abuses their authority, 
I think it's important for us to keep this in mind. Respect is earned, but honor is given. And our calling is to honor those who are in authority. You know, I once worked for a pastor who was one of these poor leaders. He belittled the staff. Uh, he accused us of disloyalty. There were times when uh, he would very much, uh, I, I hesitate to use the word scream, but he would raise his voice at the staff. Uh, he would question motives, and uh, it was a toxic environment. It was totally unhealthy. And so I decided at, at very, for actually early on, I decided it was time for me to, to transition and to go. Um, and I, when I left, when I left, I publicly honored him on the way out. I didn't agree with everything he did. I didn't agree with his leadership style. I didn't like the way he treated me. I didn't like the way he treated my family. I didn't like the way he particularly treated uh, the staff. But those weren't my problems to fix at that time. Those, that wasn't for me to do. The Psalm 75, 5 says this, It is God who judges. He brings one down and he exalts another. Another way of saying that is he sits people down, he stands people up. And in this context and where I was, it, I, David was not called to be a king killer. And I was not called to be the pastor killer. I could have disagreed with him. I didn't like what was going on, but it wasn't my place. I was there to serve that man and his vision, and that it was not working. And so I removed myself from that. So how do we respond to an unhealthy authority? I just want to give you three just kind of simple ideas that you can do. And you may do... All or none of these, or all or all or one of these, when it deals with unhealthy authority. First, walk towards, walk towards. Sometimes these situations can be redeemed, and you can be an agent for positive change. And you need to walk towards that person. Public honor can lead <coughs> to private influence, right? Public honor can lead to private influence. If you honor someone who is misusing their authority, if you do that in a public way, you may earn the right to speak into their life. You can love them. You can draw close to them. I did try that in that, in that church. It didn't work out. So I did the second one. I walked away. So you can walk towards, or sometimes you just need to walk away. Look, submitting to authority never means that you have to subject yourself to violence or abuse. I want to be very clear about that. Look, I left my, my, that position at that church because it was beginning to affect the health of my family. And look, I, we experienced some great ministry there. And by all intents and purposes, we were having successful ministry there. It was going well. I had great relationships with the students that we were ministering to. It, it tore my heart out to leave. But I knew that it was becoming unhealthy and toxic for my family, so we had to walk away. So sometimes you walk towards and you work, try to create health in that, in that relationship. And other times you just got to walk away. And then third, sometimes you have to walk with. I couldn't think of a better way to put this. But sometimes there is violence. And sometimes there is abuse. And sometimes you need to go to someone that is another person in authority and you need to get help. So if there are times where there is a physical abuse or violence, you need to go talk to somebody, report that, and have someone with you to help resolve that situation. Because there are times when leadership is so toxic that another authority over that person needs to come in and remove them from that situation. Does that make sense? So you can walk towards, you can walk away, and you can walk with. You may do all three, you may just get to one or two, but with, those are all ways that we can handle and respond to unhealthy authority in our life. Honoring authority is not always easy. And I've worked with some pastors, and it was the greatest. I, I, I love honoring them. I think of our former pastor, Pastor Phil. He's our leader of our district now. Man, what a great man to honor and to work with and to work in our district here. It's an incredible guy. I think of other pastors that I've worked with. But sometimes it's difficult to honor our authority. Sometimes it's difficult to honor our parents. But it is always worth it. Why? Because of the second part of the verse there. So that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. There's two sides to this promise. There's a practical side and there's a spiritual side to this promise. The practical side I mentioned a little bit already. God gave this command to the Israelites, really to the people that were, I mean, the, ch the children were likely there as well. But this command is really to adults. And so when an adult honors their adult parents, uh, what happens? Their children see that and they learn the pattern to follow. Right? There's a practical side of this. If you honor your aging parents in their old age, 
when you get older, your children should follow that example and honor you and care for you in your old age. So we are called to, to do this because there is blessing. There's a practical blessing. But there's also spiritual blessing as well. This is a general blessing of promise to the community that God is giving to all of his people. It's not intended for an individual. God's not saying, look, if you just honor your parents, you're going to live to 125, you know, or some number. I mean, it's not, not specific. And on, and on the inverse of that, if you break this command, uh, it, God's not saying, look, oh, sorry, you're going to be toast early on in your life, okay? That's not the point of this. When the phrase living long in the land is a Hebrew expression talking about all sorts of blessing that come uh, to your life. That, it might be financial. It might be with your family. It might be in, in relationships. I believe that the church here is reaping the blessing. I think I'm reaping the blessing of honoring uh, those pastors that I worked with, with our staff. And we've got staff here who, who honor me. They bless me. They respect and they're, we're friends and we joke around. Don't get me wrong. They do say some things. They dig at me sometimes. But, but I'm so grateful for a staff that honors and, and respects me. And I don't need that. You know what I mean? I, that's not an ego boost for me. But I think we are experiencing the blessing of the times when I worked for difficult pastors in difficult circumstances. And I think the Lord's returning that blessing on us today. Look, it is good and it's necessary for us today to evaluate our lives. Yes, we need to look at our parents. Are we honoring them? Are we valuing them? Are we treating them with the dignity that they deserve? Are we caring for them? But I think we need to also look more broadly. What about other people of authority in our life? Um, for some of us, uh, it, might be, it might be our governmental authority. Look, I know uh, I don't get too political, but like, like if you go on Facebook at all, you know it gets really ugly really quick. And maybe some of you today, you just need to consider maybe you haven't been honoring <laughs> your government. And I know you don't like every, I don't know, you don't, you're not going to like or agree with every single politician that we have. But, but that's something that we need to think about. Are we honoring, because if we honor, the, when we honor the authorities over us, we are honoring God. It's important that we keep that in mind. So we need to obey this command. And the, the difficulty is that I think sometimes we don't obey this command perhaps as well as we may think. I came across this quote. I, I love this quote. It says this, youth today love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority, no respect for older people, and talk nonsense when they should work. Young people do not stand up any longer when adults enter the room. They contradict their parents, talk too much in company, guzzle their food, lay their legs on the table, and tyrannize their elders. And all the adults in the room shook their head, right? So those kids. Do you know who said this? Socrates. Socrates. Oh, 2,400 years ago, people. This is not new. Now, some of you were like, yeah, those kids. That was you just a few, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. This is an ongoing thing, right? Kids, kids these days, kids all days, right? So you're off the hook. You're getting nervous there for a minute. This is, this is all of us. See, here's the thing. All of us, all children have dishonored their parents at one way or another. I'm not going to bed now. I'm not brushing my teeth. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to honor you. All of us, to one extent or another, have dishonored an authority in our life. We've disobeyed uh, a, you know, a, a directive from a boss or a teacher. Or whatever, the, whatever it may be, we've all broken this. Every single one of us except one. Jesus Christ. Jesus. He's the perfect child. It's, when Jesus died on the cross... He paid the penalty for all of us breaking the fifth commandment. But it wasn't just that. It wasn't just that Jesus died on our behalf. He also perfectly kept the fifth commandment. I mean, throughout Jesus' life, we don't have many interactions with him and his parents, but we see him honoring his parents. Even at the end of his life, what does he say to John? This is your mother. Take care of my mom. He, he's honoring his mother even at the end of his life. But, it, but more importantly, it wasn't just his, his earthly parents, but it was his heavenly father that he honored as well. From manger to the cross, Jesus was an obedient son who brought honor to his earthly parents and to his heavenly father. He is the perfect example of the perfect child. And when Jesus obeyed the father, he did so 
on our behalf. We say this often here. Jesus came to live the life we couldn't live. He came to be the perfect child. He came to die the death that we all deserved. And we deserved that death because we broke this command that we've been talking about today. All to provide us with the blessing that we didn't earn. Forgiveness and restored relationship with our Father in heaven. He is the perfect Savior because he has and he was and he is the perfect child. And so there's two ways that we can respond today. If you're not a believer in the room, if you're far from God, first, this is for you. Honor God by believing in his perfect son, Jesus. See, some people that are perhaps in this room today, you're not a believer, you're not a Christian, you have dishonored God with your life. And I don't even need to convince you of that. You know that. You know you've made decisions that have separated you from God. You feel far from him. You know that uh, you, you, just, you just think, I don't even know how God could ever accept me. The way he accepts you is not based on what you have done, but what Christ has done. It's, it's not based on, on your failures, but it's about Christ and what he has done on your behalf. And today, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can honor God by believing and trusting in the work of his perfect son. And then for the rest of us in the room today, honor God by honoring the people in authority over you. It's a very simple, it's a very simple uh, response. It's a very simple message, but sometimes incredibly hard to do. And for some of us, we've got a parent that we need to go honor. For some of us, there is a boss that we need to go treat differently. For some of us, we need to maybe get a little bit of an attitude adjustment when it comes to our, our discussions of politics online. But for whatever the case is for you today, let's honor God by honoring those who are authority over us. Let's